So the talk today, uh, and I've just realized that I'm probably the one day scheduled in order to clean out the venue uh, because it's such an exciting subject, is actually about maturing something from an open source project onto the road to become an international standard. So first you develop something, you open source it, then there's an open specification, and then it becomes an open standard, and then you go through all the procedural steps in order to really make it mature and make it what people expect from a standard. And that's what's going on at, at Risk Five today. And I'm probably going to get some very tough questions at the end because we also have the VP of technology for Risk Five in the room. So um, I'm looking forward to your questions later on. Uh, so my role at Risk Five really is I'm on the technical steering committee. I'm the vice chair of the technical steering committee. I'm an elected board member representing the strategic membership class um, and I do various other things. So I look after software and um, I always say I'm just a volunteer there, I'm just a delegate. This is a very small part of my, my hours in the week but somehow it keeps expanding and um, it's more of a governance story today and uh, a story about the direction than just the technical details because Risk Five is big enough that, that we can do that. So to understand where all of this is coming from, uh, Risk V is really an open standards ISA. There has been a lot of discussion, a lot of misunderstandings over the last years, whether it was open source, an open specification, or is an open standard. I just had a discussion after the last track with somebody who said, are there open source cores that implement specification A or B from Risk V? And the answer I had was, well, yes, there are. Go to that university, look at that research project, because Risk V is not developing open source cores. It is developing an open standard, an interoperability specification. And yes, we do open source enablement for that specification, but we don't provide. So the Risk V community, as a community, does not provide. Um, open source core like Rocket from Berkeley or Xiang Shan from the Beijing uh, Institute of Open Source Cores. But it is about having one ISA that we can leverage for global collaboration to innovate on it and share part of the innovation burden. So it originated at Berkeley about 10 years ago. So actually it's 14 by now. Uh, was coming out of an of a research project and they said, well, what do we do? How do we have something we can innovate on, we can share, we can't use ARM, it's a license, they restrict what we can do, what we can communicate. We can't use x86, it would be a restrictive license or none at all. And so they were going through the entire list and they came up with the need to actually roll their own unencumbered, uh, available and that's part of the DNA, that's the, the, the history of it. But what it, it, what it really is today for most of us is it's about the freedom to innovate. So it is the only ISA that you have where you can add functionality, where you can remove functionality and still create a core and build on the entire ecosystem that is available, the software ecosystem, the information, the community. Um, I always compare it to ARM. So ARM gives you the freedom to implement a core that behaves exactly the same. So if you're an architecture licensee, you can't add anything, you can't remove anything. And x86 actually gives you just the freedom to buy a chip from vendor A or from vendor B. So that way Risk Five is really about having this interoperability specification and having being the steward of uh, an ISA that you can use to innovate on and differentiate with, and that gives you a lot of freedoms. Now, that's great. It scales from small microcontrollers to very large supercomputers, but what I'm really going to talk to you about today is not the technical benefits. We can have a discussion about that any day. Um, my company is, is deeply involved in optimizing compilers for it and designing new extensions. So we can discuss the relative benefits of including extension A or not including extension A and shaping your microarchitecture appropriately. But that's not what is the most important aspect of RISC-V in these days. We're in the middle of a 
geopolitical crisis of a trade war, people trying to restrict the access to technology. And that's exactly where risk five and its freedom is kicking in. But that also means that it needs to evolve to be an actual open standards body and have documented consensus and fall under the protections of being an open standard. And what we've done to assure that and what is happening to assure that and how far we've gotten along that line, that's what we'll be discussing today. So, as I said, risk five is great. Huge disruptive potential. Uh, if you want to invest into a semiconductor company, make sure risk five is in it because there's shared infrastructure, the investment cost is lower because they don't need to roll their own ISA, their own tool chains, but can build on existing ones and only support their magic sauce. Um, and we aren't limited by a top-down flow of, of innovations. Let me just very quickly check something here. Uh, so this, is, this doesn't have to go back all the way up to Intel so that some engineer can design a new extension, new instructions, and then it trickles down. But this really brings an entire industry, an entire community, and an entire ecosystem together to drive innovation. So we're getting the benefits from every company that adopts RISC-V for their specific market. We have collaboration to remove some of the, the duplication that you would otherwise see. So not everybody is doing their own tool chain, not everybody is doing their own test suite. Again, this is shared infrastructure. People compete on where their differentiation is. People compete on adding actual differentiators, whether it's the microarchitecture, domain-specific accelerators, or some special piece of software that they can sell into a specific market. And with this freedom to innovate, our goal is to have 95%, 98%, pick a high number, of what we have shared between everybody in the Risk V community and just a little bit being proprietary, being differentiating for individual implementations so that people can innovate, that they can differentiate in the market with a product, but at the same time share as much as possible back with the community, which means putting it back into open source, making it open specifications, either as vendor specifications or making it open standards as risk five specifications. And we've been quite successful in doing that. So these 14 years have brought a lot of adopters. So actually the list of risk five adopters is way longer than this, but these are the usual cases that, that we cited. It's Western Digital, they used it for all of their internal computing needs and embedded. Um, they also open sourced a lot of their cores back into the open hardware group. Meta is doing their training accelerator on, on RISC-V. Uh, Google has their, their new TPU, the, I think it's version four, uh, based around a Sci-5 cluster with their own IP integrated. Exactly what I said before that RISC-V is, is providing. So. You remove all of the extra work and just focus on that little extra bit of work that differentiates you or that's important for your application. And China is a, is a big adopter. And since I said before, geopolitics. So China views RISC-V as something that can't be taken away from them because it's paper. It's an open specification. So all of their researchers are going into it and this also gives us a talent pool here in the West that we can build on, and it gives us some very nice open source implementations like the ones from the Beijing Institute of Open Source Chip that we can build on when we do our own designs. Now, since I said this is not about the technical aspects, this is really about what kind of animal are you? And for risk five, the kind of animal that we are is we're an open standards group. We're a standards development body. We differentiate that very clearly from being an open source project or an open specification. But we've gone through those stages at some point. I mean, some of those stages actually happened before I came to the RISC-V ecosystem and when I was still firmly focused on ARM. So this originally was an academic project. They wanted to move fast. Their focus was really to deliver incremental improvements, provide them openly, and then have a low threshold of accepting new features. This is really what open source is about. You move quickly. 
you bring people in, you accept new features, new feature, and new pull requests, and if you make a mistake, you can always undo it. This is very different from the low end of an open standard where it's very hard to undo a mistake. If we go out, if we create a specification today and say, this instruction has to work in this way, and entire software ecosystems are built on top of it. People built silicon in 22, 12, 7, 5, 3 nanometers. If we say we've made a mistake and we want to go back and change the specification, all hell is going to break loose. And all hell breaking loose is actually our smaller problem because the bigger problem is the loss of credibility. This is the sort of mistake that if you are, want to be a standards body, you can make once. Because after that, you're probably not as relevant anymore, not as trusted by, by, by the adopters. And in between those two, there's this really this, this middle ground of being an open specification. This usually happens when a company controls something and just wants people to adopt it or to, to use it, and they open it up. So that one is controlled by a small group. It's not as aggressive as just taking pull requests. And it's more about having a close-knit steering committee providing uh, something to, to a wider base. But for us on Risk Five, the goal is, is very simple. We are an open standards body. It's important because it gives us protections. It is also important because it allows us to deliver what our adopters expect, which is something stable that they can just build on. So what is a standard? And I was touching on that briefly when I said people expect stability. It's, it's really a common framework. It's the one thing that two different people use as a reference when they implement something. So when I say this is standard, somebody can implement hardware. Somebody else can also implement hardware following that standard. And a third party can implement software. And it's just going to work together. So it's really facilitating interoperability, international trade. I mean, the international center is just across the street from here. This is where all of the deliberations are more about how do we, how do we bridge gaps? How do we do things like that? So it's about having a common language that goes across an industry and helps to facilitate the interaction between actors in different countries who come from different backgrounds and all need to take um, or all need to use and build solutions based in the same domain. So here's your processor, here's the software, it works together. Uh, here's, a, here's two different processes, you transplant it between the two. And the other thing that's important about the standard is it's meant to, provo to promote both innovation and competition. You don't create a standard if you don't want to have competition. That's when you open up a specification and tell people what they can do with it. But here it's about having a level playing field and fair competition so that multiple players can actually put out RISC-V compatible compute solutions. Now, that was the definition of a standard. Now, what does it mean to be a standard if you're on the ground coming out of open source and trying to move this along? So, what does the day at risk five look? And that's really, we're trying to solve a participation gap. I said before, industry-wide consensus, facilitate trade, interoperability, all the big words. But what it means is you need to bring people into the room that actually contribute to it and agree on it and have a consensus. You can't build an international standard or even a local acceptable standard if you're just having one person in the room that says, well, I think that's a good idea. Uh, chances are very high that it's going to be a miss instead of a hit. So you need the experts coming out of all of these competing companies, out of multiple geographies, and come together in order to uh, provide the input and build a consensus that you can document. One of the pitfalls in all of this, and that's one we are constantly working to overcome at Risk Five, is what we call the, the spectator gap. So people coming in, listening in, and offering their critique very late in the process. So they've been in the room, they've 
not actively contributed, but then we have a final draft. And there's everything wrong with that draft. Because that really means that we are very bad at building consensus if we fall into that. So our processes need to help overcome that. The other thing is long-term stability is crucial. So we need rigid processes. So that said, we've had a process. We have a process. The process has been evolving. So first there was an open specification, an open source project. Then we had many iterations of the processes where this was brought into a foundation where there was a technical steering committee created, uh, where we've been trying to have some level of architectural consistency, uh, have votes on what should go ahead and what shouldn't go ahead. But all of that still needed a definition of done. Some sort of minimum level of quality for the specifications. But that was only step one. And now that we have um, a process that is mostly workable, we're trying to take this one step further. And about a year ago, uh, Risk Five took a decision to submit to become an ISO JTC1 PS submitter. Um, I'll talk about PS in a moment. PS stands for Publicly Available Standard. And what this means is that Risk Five wants its standards or its specifications to be fast-tracked towards becoming an ISO standard. Now, again, this is all about governance. This is all boring and process-oriented. Uh, but what it gives us is a chance to have Risk Five, the Risk Five ISO and these extensions, actually being listed as an ISO IC standard once we have completed this and to have the protections of being an international standard. For that, however, we need to provide a small number of, of requirements and fulfill them. And those requirements are all going back to what I said before. What is a standard? What do people use it for? So ISA doesn't just want to pick up any document that anybody wrote that might not be supported tomorrow, that might have questionable quality. So they say, well, you have to be an international recognized organization with broad membership, not just from one country. Non-discriminatory, let people in. There has to be a process in order to do that. So open transparent procedures. How do we ensure that people have the ability to contribute to the specification and have their voices heard as we develop it? How do we document that? And how do we make sure that just because somebody works for a software company it doesn't mean that all the people that want to tape this out in silicon will say, well, what do you know? This is just stay with your software. Uh, we're the hardware people here. Um, you have to demonstrate technical expertise as an organization. So your specification should have some weight. We have that in risk five because our specifications have been taped out in pretty advanced nodes. We have Linux booting on it. We have pretty good software stacks and a strong reputation. So that part is done. But that technical expertise needs to be also backed up by a strong structured process that ensures that this technical expertise is actually heard and ends up in the standard. And the goal to that, all of that is long-term commitment. So if ISO picks up a standard, they don't want us to go back and say, well, after all, we changed our mind and what we said last year as a standard, it's not a good idea. We'd like to do it entirely differently because for them, it's a reputation topic and downstream, it's a return on investment and an investment cost topic for anybody picking up the standard. So this also means that we need to be serious about that as we are and we need to demonstrate that. So what does the risk five process until now look like? And as I said, we have pretty much almost everything that we need to become an ISO submitter, a PAS submitter. Uh, I'll go into some fine tunings that we do as we wrap up, but I just want to give you a quick overview of, of what we do in risk five today already or for the last couple of years in order to have almost everything that we need for past submissions. So, 
we don't do just things out of curiosity or because somebody comes up with a pull request and says this is a good idea. It's a structured top-down process. So there are stewards of this, which is the Technical Steering Committee and uh, a number of other committees like in a, a standards body. So we delegate certain authority and governance. And when work should be started, we first need a group, uh, a working group, a task group. So there needs to be a charter, a well-defined problem statement. And then you can apply to have a specification started. That really means you form a group to investigate the problem, come up with a solution, have it peer reviewed, have the software enablement, a proof of concept, and can go out to a public review. All of that is necessary to, to do that. So we're having basically a group life cycle which owns the specification process, a specification life cycle underneath that. And then we have a software development life cycle uh, which has more to do with what do we do when we actually want to upstream things. Ignore the software development life cycle, that one is pretty standard. But the important thing is you want to write a specification, you need to get approval to start a group. That group will have membership and it's going to be wide representation. It's not just, we hope that somebody contributes, but there have to be actual sponsors, resource commitments, and especially this plan milestone that's in there says, by when will you want, to, uh, by when will you have done certain things and what resources are you going to use? But let me first dive more into the, the, the group life cycle. And that one is quite interesting because forming a group is not something you do yourself. It's not like you step up, you say, hey, I want to form a group. Me and my three friends, we're going to write the specification to make um, string processing better. Um, you first have to come up with a clear problem statement a problem statement that will be reviewed by people that will get voted on outside of that group. You have to do strategy and gap analysis. So what market are you attending, uh, addressing? Why does that market need this? How is it going to make risk five better? What's going to be the impact on implementers? And all of that is brought back. And only if you get through all of these stages with peer review, peer review means that all of the TSC member companies uh, and some others are going to have an opinion on it. And some of them will have an embedded background, others will have a high performance background. Some will try to build super scalar data center chips. Others are trying to build in order uh, microcontroller cores to license and they'll weigh in. And you need to get through that gate. You need to get the majority of people to say, well, this is really necessary. It is necessary at this time. And the solutions that are likely to come out of this group actually have a chance of, of, of being valuable for us. I just included that for uh, reference. It's from the RISC-V lifecycle guide. So there's a lot of work behind this, a lot of people and a lot of reviews. Now, let's say you and your three friends actually came up with a very good proposal because your three friends are all major risk five companies that can throw in the, the necessary resources to do the, the initial um, conceptual work. Now we start the, the specification life cycle. And that one starts with a plan. We don't start with give us an implementation. We want to know when are we going to see that? How are we going to validate this? What is your proof of concept going to have? Because the proof of concept, that one gets defined at the ratification plan stage. The proof of concept needs to enable people to take this, play with it end to end, and tell us if it works. So something not that favorable about how things happened in the past around risk five that I heard at GCC Cauldron was we didn't do a full proof of concept on vector. And now some of the compilers out there are having a hard time to make use of, of it fully. So it's good. It's very good. It could be better. 
And we could have simplified it maybe if we had done a full proof of concept. So the goal for the last two, three, four years is to actually have a full proof of concept. So you implement the hardware at least in a simulator in QEMO. You have a tool chain addressing it. You implement it in an operating system and in one or two user space applications. So let's take vector crypto. We added vector crypto about a year and a half ago. In order for it to actually go to public review, it had to be enabled in OpenSSL, in the Linux kernel, in QEMO, and well, given that it's vector crypto, it was just intrinsic support in the compilers. But the whole thing, we took that out. One of the first feedbacks already during the implementation was, this is not gonna fly. This, is, this, this one instruction here for Ghash is really nice from the mathematical properties, but it's actually the other way from how it's used in the Linux kernel and in OpenSSL. So they went back and changed that because they said, well, it doesn't make a difference for us on the specification side, but this feedback is valuable and we, we, we would really have hurt ourselves in the long term and had to, to change our spec. So all of this, again, it's about quality, it's about predictability. So it's less like a classic open source project despite us being open source than doing central planning and making sure you have your product development going. We have the specification development and the freeze tasks. So the freeze tasks are exactly what we planned before, like doing your proof of concept, getting your compiler enabled. And then we go into a number of review cycles. And what's important is there is a point that we call freeze where there are no changes to specification allowed. At this point, ISA would call it a final committee draft. At this point, we're just going out to the public to gather additional input. And this is really the time when we engage with groups like the Linux community or GCC or LVM to say, well, we're at freeze. So please merge our changes now. Uh, please merge our baseline patches. At this point, we may have to make changes, but it's not really like there's going to be anything surprising in there. It's more like bug fixes, clarifications. And after that, after freeze, so all of your reviews start. We're sending this off to public mailing lists as well. Uh, some things go out as RC patches to Linux, uh, other things to the compiler groups, and we hope that we get actual input from the communities. This is an area where things could be better, things could be smoother. There could be more participation. So Risk Five really appreciates feedback, even if it's along the lines of, uh, I think Palmer wrote that on the Linux mailing list once, Risk Five is a train wreck. Um, so try to keep it civil, but having a discussion, even if it's in, even if it uses rough words, is better than not having a discussion, and then figuring out two years later that nobody is really using that specification. So. Uh, when 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 Risk Five hits the mailing list, just put your questions in. That's that's what the people that drove the specification, the proponents, should answer and help answer. Because any comment, any feedback, any questions make the spec better. And at some point, plenty of days later, we're having pretty long public reviews where we're giving enough time to do changes. Uh, we hope to actually send that up for ratification, then for a board vote at risk five, and only then is it a standard. But between freeze and all that time that passes, nothing fundamental should change anymore, unless somebody really pulls the emergency brake, because one of the public reviews spots the fact that pretty much every quality check before has failed. Um, there's also a fast track life cycle. Um, just ignore that one. The picture is misleading because it's the same one as the other one. It just skips um, some things. So the, the way the specification gets created is a bit streamlined. No group is formed uh, and it goes to, to review more quickly. Beautiful tables again. So I talked about all these processes and probably put half of the room to sleep. Um, the question is, wh what did we 
what did we identify that we wanted to change? So I said, process just before. These diagrams are actually old. We've used them for two, two and a half, three years. And there's actually a surprisingly small number of changes. So yes, some fine tuning. We take only one vote instead of two because it's the same people voting twice after each other. Uh, so things that just accumulated over time as the policies evolved. But there's two really big changes that we identified and where we're fine tuning. And the first one is exactly this participation gap I mentioned before. The worst thing is, if this is a pure spectator sport, we're ending up at the, uh, with, with a specification that nobody really has their, their weight behind or that gets fully written and the people that wrote it get frustrated because they can't get it over the finish line. Because if everybody was in the room and then at the end everybody second guesses it, this is not going to ever show consensus. So for that we need both a stick and a carrot because there's two things that can happen. People aren't participating because they don't have a direct interest. That's where you need the carrot. And the stick is for those who say, well, let all of our competitors do the work. And we then have all of our smart comments at the end and just jump in at the final review stage in order to make this more digestible to the solutions we have. And designing the stick and the carrot was actually the same. It turned out what we have to do is we, we have to go in with voting rights. So how do we enforce that people contribute? If they want to have a say in the end, they have to participate when it gets done. They have to be in the kitchen while we're cooking this. This is actually straight from the playbook of other standards bodies. ISO does that, uh, ECMA does that, uh, Wi-Fi Alliance, pretty much everybody. So they say only if you participate and if you attend, whatever, you get voting rights in the end. Now, participating means you have to give feedback. So something gets sent around as a draft and in game theory or generally what would be your way to subvert the process? You just give an empty comment. You say everything's good for me with the intention of jumping in later. But now that we're doing that in a formal process or as we're moving towards that, that means if you give an empty feedback, it means you agree. You can't really go back from that. So there's a real trade-off that you have. Either you don't get voting rights in the end because you're not participating or you're participating and then in order to make your participation meaningful for yourself and not actually detrimental, your participation is also to be meaningful for the process. So an empty comment doesn't do it anymore. It's not just, yeah, all good. Uh, but if you have a concern, you have to voice it early. And that's really our stick and the carrot. So people get to say, everybody can sign up to, every company, every individual even can sign up to participate in the specification process. But it means active participation, otherwise um, they, they might end up with a spec they don't like. And the second thing that we've realized we need to do is, Risk Five is growing. Uh, I think we're at 4,000 individual members now 400 strategic members, 20, 30 premier members. So it's quite a lot. And if you measure it in the amounts of venture capital or market cap that some of those members have, it's even more because Qualcomm, Nvidia, Microsoft, all of them are members, Google. But we still can't do everything at once. And that's a realization that we've, we've come to when we were working on tightening the process. So how do we ensure we can long-term support what we do? How can we make things meaningful? And that's focusing on a clear roadmap on what matters. Because too many specification projects in flight mean that nothing really moves and many of those things will be abandoned by the time that they pass the finish line. There's a couple of old proposals that have been going on for four years and that haven't been shut down because they were coming in under old rules. And the most important thing about that is to saying everything is time limit. You write your spec proposal, 
you have 18 months to get this to a vote, to an actual public review vote, or we don't believe you that this is really meaningful to the market. Just time box it. And the stewards of this will be the technical steering committee, so the, the, the discussions that I'll see on that one are going to be even more politically charged in the future than they've been in the past, but those are really the only two big changes that we identified. So risk five is really in a good shape. We've matured a lot, but these two major gaps are the ones we, we need to close. And I gave a presentation about a year ago in China, and back then, so I pulled that slide in. Back then I had identified, or actually a year and a half ago, this was before risk five decided to go to house ISO. I said, we have three things we need to improve on our process. The first one is to facilitate contributions across geographies, time zones, because it's very much time indexed to the US. A lot was going on in meetings. And that's really something that being a real standards body changes because we've, we've modified our behavior and we're much more conductive to having contributions coming in across multiple time zones into the same spec. Second one was um, keep freedom of choice going. So make sure we don't end up being over standardizing, uh, not allowing innovation. Again, this is something that we've been reflecting in what we've do, been doing by saying, well, we need a wide consensus just as any standard. We need many people coming in and they need to be happy with what we do because they can still differentiate. And the final one was we needed more engagement from the industry champions, which means the people that have the applications that want to use it, they need to come in. And that's where the participation gap is being addressed today. And with that, I'm concluding this one. I think we have time for questions if we want to, because nobody is coming after us. <laughs> I mean, probably do you. Go ahead. Yeah, back to crypto. Yeah, that was Jay Hash, yeah. So. It could have been done in the kernel because the, the difference for us was that we would have needed, if we had kept the, the mathematical construction the same way, we would have needed a vector move before starting the process, an extra vector move all the time. Because um, I don't remember the details of how the, the, the crypto experts explained it. But so it would have been just an extra vector move. We would have had to move zero into a vector register over and over again uh, in order to, to drive the computation. Um, all the other architectures basically have the construction that RISC-V has now. The trade-off was, do we force all of the software projects to follow us? given that the software projects already support ARM x86, or do we simply change things around because they're equivalent? There's no penalty for us doing it differently uh, so that we are better citizens and easier to, to have software move to us. So th this was really, the risk 5 spec was originally done by cryptographic experts that just took the mathematical concept and weren't looking at how the implementations did it. And it saves you one vector register move. So yes, there's a good reason. And uh, you discover that by doing the proof of concept, by actually enabling it and testing it and benchmarking it and figuring out that everybody else did it differently. So, uh, and we're, we're seeing that across, or we've been seeing that across many specifications. You can't really build a standard if you don't look at how it's used. And not just look at it, how it's used, but do the work, test it, learn from it and take that back into the standard. Sometimes the sometimes the, the purest and most straightforward solution is actually um, not the, the one that the, the rest of the world expects. 
because there's also tradition, so history. If everybody else has been doing it the other way around, why would you break uh, tradition? That is exactly um, a common thing I'm hearing when people go into specification efforts. That's when you're having somebody and his three friends starting a spec and they're all, for example, crypto experts, uh, but haven't spent much time outside of the, the actual mathematical models. So you'll, you'll never be able to keep up with them when it comes to the actual crypto and uh, vulnerability surfaces and the math. But on the other hand, they don't know what's implemented out there. Sure, Andrea. I'm not sure if you and I had that discussion, but I, I, I Is it too as a actually it's not. So, so first of all, I, so, so this, this is a bit of an inside conversation now. I had the discussion with John that ISO JTC1 really wants to see this used in product, um, that, that we're actually threading with, with what we're doing in our ratification process, where we're threading this. They, they would really want this implemented in multiple vendor products before seeing it as an international standard. And the thing with the opcodes is, is madness because we have only one non-renewable resource in Risk Five, and that's our opcode space. And right now, there is no strong counter pressure on that. I really think that this should be one of the key decisions at the board level. So now that I'm treasurer, I can look at the, the budgets and say, yes, no, this is not a good idea. But this is not the same on the opcode side. We are sometimes just burning opcodes for, for a niche topic and our 32 opcodes, so the 32-bit opcode space for risk five is almost exhausted. This is a little known fact. We have, I think, only one opcode left where we can put the 12-bit immediate in, and the rest is a little bit here, a little bit there. So we're going to 48 and 64-bit opcodes now as an extension, so longer than, than 32. This is actually one of the priority initiatives, and um, to answer that question, we should say hell no when somebody wants opcode space and it's not giving us a proper return. This, this is the only thing we can't, we can't bring back. So once we have 64-bit opcodes, uh, of course we can be generous. So here have your 50,000 opcodes, do with it whatever you want. Uh, what do we care? We have 64-bit opcodes. But up until then, we need to be very selective. And there's one thing I want for three, four years now, four and a half. So, and that's a bit filled insert instruction. And I can't get opcode space for exactly that reason, because people were not conservative with it before. And it's, yeah, it's, I, I've, 
I can only say yes and yes. We, we, we should be very restrictive on the opcodes and uh, having a, a proper implementation should be something that, or people committing to it, that should go back into this. Um, and there's two things to, to add on to that. For GCC, we require, if it's a vendor extension, we require a statement that a product has actually been announced with an introduction date, otherwise we don't let it in. And if the product doesn't materialize, we've said we're going to revert your vendor-specific extension support very quickly because academic-only instructions don't have a place upstream. This is maintenance madness. Um, so as I said, I'm just back from, from Cauldron, and one of the big things in GCC is moving to SLP only. Um, so the tree vectorizer goes, the super super word level parallelism uh, vectorizer stays, and we're moving everything there. And we've, with one of our customers, one of our ARM customers, we've been working on something to make, to create more dot product extensions, uh, instructions. For, for benchmark improvements. Now that is based on the tree vectorizer and uh, we've been working on a plan how to get it in and the only way to get it in is to put it to what's after there because the maintainer very clearly said, I'm not gonna accept this because otherwise I have to take care of it or I have to revert it. So th there's also the infrastructure changes to look at and ke keep your stuff tidy. It's a bit like a good kitchen. I've, I've seen a good movie recently and I've learned that all the highly decorated chefs keep their kitchens spotless and well organized. Um, any other questions? I mean, now we're over time. Okay. Go ahead. In, in that specific case, it didn't have, uh, it, it wasn't about better. It was about going left or right. So it's how do you manifest it? And usually if it's about better or not, you're going to get long and very passionate discussions. And that's not going to fly that easily. Uh, so if you can show that this is 20% better, well, uh, or 5% better, if you have actual quantitative reasons or even structural reasons like this avoids an entire attack uh, vector, uh, it's very hard to ignore. Actually, it's impossible to ignore. The problem is that 90% of cases of doing it differently don't have such a justification. And it's about filtering those 90%. The other ones we should celebrate. The other 10 cases of doing it different, we should celebrate. But these 90% we, we, we don't want because it's, it's making us unnecessarily different. And um, software ecosystem maintainers don't like that. All right. Thank you. Thank you.